Good afternoon, everyone. It's lovely to see so many of you here, um, both in church, and we hope that there are some people watching online, but the talks will be available online afterwards, so you can always catch up if you miss anything, um, and we're delighted to be working with Friends of the Earth Norwich again on this wonderful day of talks and exploration of how we can create a healthy environment in Norwich. So, with no further ado, I'm going to hand over to our chair. Thank you. I'm a little bit shorter, can you hear me? <laughs> um, again, welcome. Um, I'm very grateful to all of you who've chosen to be inside rather than enjoying the sunshine, although actually it's quite nice to, uh, to have a little bit of cool, isn't it? Um, I'd like to welcome you all um, to this great, big, this great Big Green Week that has been organised by Friends of the Earth. Um, my name is um, Dr Hayley Pinto. I'm a, a doctor by background, but I now work for the Centre for Sustainable Healthcare, um, teaching uh, people in healthcare organisations, including the NHS across the world, how to achieve sustainability. Um, and one of the things that, that, that climate change and, and, and the ecological crisis remind us of is how we are so dependent on the natural world. So I'm really excited to introduce our speakers today who are going to talk about some of those aspects um, of, of the natural world and, and from a medical perspective, I'm so aware of how important they are for our health. Um, so we're going to be talking about land and food, um, about water and our rivers, about our air and about our urban environments. Um, and we'd like to start with um, Professor Claire Reeves, who's going to talk about air quality. Claire is an Emeritus Professor of Atmospheric Science at UEA, and she also sits on a joint DEFRA and um, Department for Transport uh, Committee, providing in independent assessments of local authority air quality plans. So I'll hand over to Claire. Right, hello. Thank you very much for the invitation from Friends of the Earth to speak today. Um, so I started with the title of A Breath of Fresh Air, but I wanted to then go on to give you a quote from uh, Florence Nightingale. So it's, it's the unqualified result of all my experience with the sick that second only to their need of fresh air is their need of light. So going back well over 100 years ago, Florence Nightingale recognised that what she's saying, that air, fresh air was the most important thing for human health. So what constitutes fresh air? So the simple answer is air containing only small concentrations of pollution in it. So what pollutants are we concerned about? So I've just listed the three main pollutants that we have air quality standards um, in the UK um, for. So nitrogen dioxide, now that can lead to um, irritation of the airways or lung disease. Particulate matter is another important pollutant, which is a mix of lots of different particles in the atmosphere. That can lead to chronic um, obstructive pulmonary disease, COPD, various lung cancers, heart disease, can also affect the brain, so cerebral vascular disease and cognitive development. And then ozone, which also can lead to COPD. We all know that we want ozone high up in the atmosphere because that protects us from the, the sun's strong UV light, but down where we breathe it, it's actually bad for us if we have it in um, significant amounts. I'll talk a bit more about that later. So first of all, how polluted is Norfolk? Well, the very simple answer is it's relatively clean, that's the good news, but it, it does depend on the pollutant. And then, even though it is relatively clean, how can we actually improve air quality in Norfolk? And again, that really depends on the pollutant and there are various different ways. So what I'm going to do is go through each of those three pollutants I spoke about before and try and answer these questions in a little bit more detail. Now, I'm not sure that you're going to be able to see some of these figures very well because the colours are, are a bit uh, hard to see. So this is nitrogen dioxide, and this shows uh, the mean uh, annual mean um, concentrations of, of nitrogen dioxide. Now, what you see is actually all very dark across most of the, the country, and that's because across most of the country, the concentrations are pretty low, and they're well below the objective of 40 micrograms per metre cubed. What you might be able to see... Um, is 
around the big urban areas, particularly London, you can see the lighter colours, and that's the higher concentrations. Now, this is background concentration, so this is more in the sort of um, rural or residential areas rather than close to roads. So, one of the main sources, and again, I'll say more about that, is from roads, and hence why the, the strongest concentrations are in the city centres. It's also because nitrogen dioxide is very short-lived, so they don't spread very far. They're only in the atmosphere for a, a few hours before they're lost from the atmosphere, and so the high concentrations are always close to the sources. So, if we look at nitrogen dioxide in Norwich, um, there have been well. The North Norwich City Council has a whole load of uh, measurement sites across the city, some of which you can see here marked as dots on this map. And during the, the five years of 2017 to 2021, there were seven measurement sites in Norwich that exceeded this air quality standard of 40 micrograms per metre cubed. So those were um, sites up on St. Augustine Street, um, around uh, Chapperfield, uh, sort of the end of Chapperfield at the top of Grapes Hill, around that area, St Stephen's, Castle Meadow, and then down near um, the station, Riverside Road near the station. Now the good news is, is that Norwich City Council have been putting in various um, programmes to try and reduce concentrations, and that's been successful. So um, although there were seven sites over that period had exceeded the, these levels, um, there were no sites that exceeded the levels in 2020 and only one site, and that's one of those on St. Augustine Street that exceeded it in 2021, so the latest data I could get hold of. And even then, it was only at 40.2 micrograms per metre cube, so it's only just above um, the, the limit. So, it, it, on the whole, Norwich is pretty good for air quality, at least in terms of, of NO2. But, of course, you know, we can always do better... And so how can we actually reduce concentrations of NO2? So the main sources, as I mentioned before, were from motor vehicles. So ways that we can reduce our emissions of NO2 are to drive smoothly, try to avoid excessive braking and excessive acceleration because that leads to higher emissions from the exhaust. Obviously, as we move to um, newer vehicles, which have got the, the higher uh, Euro standards, they will have... Um, have to meet lower limits for their emissions, so that will improve air quality. And ultimately, moving to electrical vehicles or hybrids on the way, um, we can reduce emissions of NO2. Also, just going to public transport, reducing our use of cars, that will help. And ultimately, the best thing to do is to switch to active travel, walking and cycling. So these are ways that we can reduce the concentrations of NO2 in, in our cities and, and around the whole of Norfolk. So if we look at particulate matter, um, now again, you, it's going to struggle to see this figure. What is different about this figure is that there's a colour graduation going from the southeast up to the northwest with higher concentrations in the south. And although London shows higher concentrations, it's, it's fairly well spread across the country. So, um, on the whole, the concentrations are below the, the, uh, the limit of 20 micrograms per metre cube, but we see this graduation with higher concentrations in the south and southeast, which is obviously where, where we live. And that's partly because particulate matter exists in the atmosphere much longer. It exists for days. So we've all heard in the news this week about the Canadian fires and how that particulate matter is getting as far as New York or even Florida. It's because it exists and can stay in the atmosphere for days. And so the concentrations of particulate matter will get spread across the country and also um, they will come from abroad. So if we have easterly airflow, we can get particulate matter coming across from Europe, um, and the other thing about particulate matter, and I'll go on to that in the next few slides, is that there are lots of different sources. It's not just a single major source like we have with nitrogen dioxide, which is primarily from cars. So if we look at particulate matter in, in Norwich specifically, there are two sites, one at Castle Meadow and one at Lakenfields, which is just behind um, uh, County Hall in a residential area. We can see that the concentrations over the last five years at each of these sites is well below the, the, the government limit of 20 micrograms per metre cubed. 
However, you might have read in, in recent months and over the last year about WHO bringing in an air quality target. This is the World Health Organization saying that really we should try to limit particulate matter concentrations below five micrograms per meter cube, which of course you can see that we exceed that in Norwich. Now through the Environment Act, which the government has been working on and bringing in over the last couple of years, they've set a new target of um, 10 micrograms per metre cubed to be reached um, in the UK by 2040. So Norwich is uh, currently in the last couple of years has been below that level, but of course, you know, we still want to try and get down below the WHO level. So what can we do? So what are the different sources of particulate matter? Well, some of them are emitted directly into the atmosphere, so we call us a primary source. So most people think that the biggest source from their cars is their exhaust, but actually it's your, your brake and your tyres. And you think about you have to replace your brakes and tyres, well, where does all that material go? It's worn down and it can get um, you know, thrown up into the atmosphere, as well as road abrasion, the road service. We all know about roads being eroded and potholes, don't we? Um, so that's a big source of particulate matter in the atmosphere. Wood burning stoves. If you have a wood burning stove, then you need to follow the, the rules about how dry wood should be, um, use modern efficient burners, try and limit the amount of time you actually use a wood burner. So there's lots of information about how to burn better. If you have waste, don't burn it in a compost. You know, sorry, burn it in a bonfire, you know, that creates lots of particles. Compost your, your green waste. And also, disposable barbecues, although they give off a little bit of you know, particles into the atmosphere, they are the major causes of wildfires in this country. So a lot of the wildfires and the, the smoke that gets given out from that comes from people not disposing of barbecues properly, so don't use them if you can avoid it. Now, particulate matters can also be formed in the atmosphere from gases. So we can emit gases into the atmosphere. They can react together and form particles. So I'm going to give you a couple of examples. So volatile organic compounds, VOCs, um, they come from a number of sources. And then when they get into the atmosphere, they can react with nitrogen oxides, which I've just been talking about. And they produce a low volatility compound, so something that condenses quickly and that then forms or, or goes on to existing particles. So some examples of sources of, of these VOCs are actually indoors. Um, a lot of people use a lot of different cleaning products, um, fragrance products and things in the house. If you think about things that have got a lemon smell, that's got these, this, um, gives off a gas called limonene, or if you have a pine fresh, that gives off another uh, gas called pinene. And these, um, again, are these low volatility, um, sorry, vol volatile organic compounds, which when they react can form particles. Frying is another big source of particles indoors. So they give off a lot of fatty acids and again, more VOCs. So think about your in door environment, because actually you probably spend more time indoors than outdoors. So that's a, a, an area to think about when you're trying to reduce your exposure to air pollution. Another source, oh, that's not moving on now. Uh, well, it seems to have frozen. Oh, I see. Oh, I didn't see that. Yes, yeah, sorry. Yes, thank you. Um, so, something that's highly relevant for East Anglia are ammonia emissions. And again, they can react with nitric acid in the atmosphere, which comes again from um, sort of combustion sources of nitrogen oxide. And when ammonia reacts with nitric acid, it forms ammonium nitrate, which again can condense and form particles. And one of the big sources, one of the major sources of ammonia is actually farming. So from slurry and, and animal waste, um, and also from fertilizers. So there's a whole load of information about how farming practices should you know, follow certain codes to reduce emissions of ammonia. Okay, so I'm just going to go on to ozone. Um, again, you can't see this very well, I apologise. Again, what we see here is a north-south gradient with the highest concentrations in, in the southeast, again, in sort of where we are. 
Um, and actually, the lowest concentrations are in the urban areas. And this is due to sort of some complex chemistry where actually when a nitrogen oxide is emitted directly into the atmosphere, it actually immediately reduces ozone. So the concentrations of ozone will be lower in Norwich than they are outside in our sort of rural environment for, for the rest of Norfolk. Again, ozone has a lifetime of several days, so it can get spread across the country and also it can be transported in from the continent. So um, we are well below the target of, um, so this is a strange metric actually, it's, it's the average number of days with daily maximum running mean of eight hour concentrations above 60 parts per billion. So it's actually just looking at the number of days when ozone is very high concentration. And the target is to not have more than 25 days. Well, from across the country, we're well below that. But the government has a long-term target of having zero days exceeding that, and we are above that at present. There are a number of different metrics that you can use, and one that's recommended by the DEFRA um, Committee on um, Medical... Uh, sorry, Medical... Um, I can remember what it stands for. Um, yeah, Medical... Um, on atmospheric pollution, I forget the acronym, but this COMIAP, sorry, they essentially recommend a, um, a threshold of zero. So what they're saying is that no concentration of ozone um, but is below which you actually have no health effects. So any level of ozone will affect you. And the bad news about that is that that metric is showing increases over time. And that's complicated by the fact that in, we've been reducing nitrogen oxides because we've tried to reduce them from motor vehicles and as a result in urban areas we're actually increasing ozone in the urban areas but in the long run it's the right thing to do to reduce ozone because ozone is not emitted directly into the atmosphere it's formed in the atmosphere again through reactions between nitrogen oxides and, and these volatile organic compounds so we need to ultimately reduce our emissions of nitrogen oxide, reduce our emissions of VOCs, and then we can reduce the ozone concentrations. The other thing that affects ozone formation is sunlight. And that sort of brings me to my last point, that although we can do a lot to reduce emissions, which is what we should do, from a day-to-day basis, we actually affected a lot by weather. So we've experienced these high pressure systems across the UK and well, sort of over the UK for the last few weeks now. And that's trapping pollution. It means that pollution can't escape. If we have a strong winds and we have um, frontal systems, it can disperse the pollution. Um, and also, as I said before, you know, we get this transport of, of pollutants across from Europe, and that depends which way the wind is blowing. And of course, we can transport it to Europe as well when we've got westerly airflow. And obviously, as climate changes, it affects our weather patterns, and so it can affect air pollution. So just in summary, Norfolk has, in general, good air quality, um, and it's mostly below the limits but there are things that we can do to improve it for ourselves and, and for others. So I shall stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Claire. Um, just to say, we've decided it would probably be best if we hold all questions until the end. There will be um, uh, quite a bit of time at the end for everyone to ask their questions. But for now, what we want to do is move on to talk about water. So I'd like to introduce Tim Fisher from the Norfolk Rivers Trust, who is their volunteering and engagement officer. Thank you. Um, to, yes, that'd be amazing. Yeah, I'll definitely need that. Um, really lovely to be here. Um, and thank you, Friends of the Earth, for inviting Norfolk Rivers Trust. I'm here to talk about um, water, so I'm gonna skip through and start with the question, which is the title, which is why is Norfolk's water precious? And I'm sure in your heads, you're already thinking of the answers to that. Um, it's a complicated answer. We all know Norfolk is a bit of a dry county, um, but if we think globally, I've got the clicker, haven't I? Water is life. We've seen lovely images of this for a long time, since 1969, and we know that our planet is blue, and it's blue for a reason. Oh, pressing wrong buttons, good start. Noel, I might need your help. 
I might do it manually. <laughs> so we are global. Um, we know that. It's been a strong message for years and years amongst the environmental movement. Um, so this is an interesting infographic showing how rain in our part of the, uh, the world is shared amongst us as individuals. Um, so you can see the west of Scotland. Each person in the west of Scotland has a nice amount of rain. And you can see us in the lovely east with slightly less rain um, for us to use. Um, so that's just a really interesting idea that, and, and if you look at Scandinavia and the northern parts of Russia you can see it's low population, high rainfall across that proportion of the population. And we're probably all thinking about this uh, as we were driving into Norwich or how we got into Norwich. We are still in a drought situation so this was, um, our CEO was at a meeting with the Environment Agency um, about this report which was published at the end of last month. So you can see that most of Norfolk is still in drought. So why is Norfolk's water precious? Um, and at work we're talking constantly about water obviously uh, and rain obviously but also water as a resource. We're really lucky in Norfolk we've got 85% of Norfolk uh, world chalk streams um, in England and a good proportion of those are in Norfolk so the Stifke, the Glaven, the Bure, the Wensum uh, and we have these lovely creatures and lovely plants that grow in those rivers but we all know the media as well we've had lots and lots of media coverage of what's going on with the state of our rivers and these are some of the issues. So those of us that move across the county have probably seen this. We saw this fairly recently, actually, maybe six, seven weeks ago when we had high rainfall events, um, flash flooding, topsoil being um, washed away from the fields onto our roads, into our drainage systems, into our rivers. Um, and so Norfolk's got, and it's not unique, uh, but if we're focusing on Norfolk, then these are the problems we have. We've got uh, historical straightening and deepening of rivers um, because we treated rivers as a way as a vector for transporting out water we thought water was a problem uh, it uh, meant we couldn't cultivate our fields 12 months of the year um, we thought it was a good way of stopping flooding uh, in urban centers um, but that's that's changing um, We've also, yeah, so this is a good example of what can happen very quickly. So, a fairly dry river, um, and then after 20 mil of rain, we get this situation here. And Claire was talking about air as transporting pollution, and obviously water transports pollution as well. A whole multitude of things. Um, and more extremes. So here's John, one of my colleagues, standing in, the, in a riverbed that's dry. And then two weeks apart, we get these sudden rainfall events and we get flooding, such as we see on the right of the picture. So how did we get there? Lots and lots of historical reasons. As humans, as a species, we love resources and we love using them. And actually rivers are quite handy. So, you know, from the Vikings moving up through uh, towards York to settle, um, so transport, as a means of power, um, as a means of washing, drinking, food production, um, and as we get closer to the present, leisure and pleasure now as well. But you can see on the left hand side, we've got an intensification of lots of things, whether it's agriculture and then it's population growth, combined with the fact that systems that were built 50, 60, 70 years ago are now aging and there's not been very much uh, money being put into upgrading those um, systems and so we then 21st century we're now thinking about water as being quite a scarce resource we're thinking a lot about sewage spills uh, we're thinking about flooding and protecting our own homes and the homes of um, and the places where we work and we're also Norfolk thinking about sea level rise as well I feel like I'm spreading lots of doom but it will end with hope because <laughs> there's some exciting things happening but so Norfolk precious water. In your minds, just think, who uses more water? If you could group people together, users together, who do you think uses more water? Can I ask for a show of hands? 
So what about people who live in their homes? Do they use more water compared to, so what else uses water? To factories, or agriculture, or, I don't know, water parks, centre parks, leisure. Anyone got any ideas? Do you think industry uses more water? Or do you think the domestic? So industry uses more water? Domestic contexts? Agriculture, okay. Power station, well, yeah, lots of water there. So yeah, we've got our domestic settings and our agriculture and industry. So this is from a few years ago, 2017, I think. And it shows for East Anglia, the proportion of how our water is used. So you can see that 81% of the water that comes into catchment into, into East Anglia is used by public, by homes, okay? And I'm as guilty as most people. I love cycling through Norfolk, and I quite often be shaking my head when I see potatoes being irrigated. <laughs> However, um, we need to work together, so not just those living in homes, but those working in factories and those farming the land to solve this problem. Okay, because we are, yeah, we are using lots of water. So this is from a report from 2009, so for WWF. So for every glass of water we use in our homes and businesses, we need to take 1.4 glasses of water out from the natural environment. And actually, if we look at our soft drinks industries, a can of fizzy pop, 330 uh, mil can, often needs about nine cans of water to get that can onto the supermarket shelf because of the processing. So water is precious. Um, and we've heard lots in the media about how we use our water, how it's abstracted, how it comes into our homes, um, how we treat it and what we do once it's been treated. And our, our chalk rivers are very special because that chalk aquifer is spongy, it holds water, it, the minerals within that chalk is wonderful and it creates a lovely habitat that is quite unique. And so we have fairly unique animals and plants growing there and the water quality is wonderful. But at the same time, in Norfolk we're using that water for drinking water, for industry and immunity and agriculture. And it's being exported out of catchment as well. So if we take us back to our domestic context, now we know that 81% of water in East Anglia is used by us as home livers. Um, let's think more about these figures. So an average family of four, this is again since 2009, so these will have changed, will have the equivalent of 60 metres of river extracted from the environment to meet their water usage requirements. So if you sort of visualise that, um, it's quite immense really. Um, and then how do we break, how do we use that water? Here's a breakdown to so personal washing and toilet flushing. The world's a better place for personal washing and toilet flushing. I mean, if you think about um, basil jet in the Victorian period and cholera, um, we're a lot healthier because of our uh, infrastructure with water. Um, and there are lots of things that we've been talking about for decades now, about how we can reduce our water use at home. So, hands up, who turns the tap off when brushing their teeth? Yeah, it's a classic, isn't it? It's, it's, yeah, really important, really important. So we've already made some behavioural changes over the last few decades, and there's more we can do. So now, 47% of us turn off the tap whilst brushing our teeth. And people have showers instead of baths. Um, but we can still make bigger savings. So we now, you know, generally toilets installed in new builds or renovations will have efficient toilets. It, it shocks me to think that every flush is drinking water. It's, it's amazing. Because um, there's a lot of energy that's gone into processing that water. Oh, it's done the same thing now. Yeah, continue. Ooh. Thank you. Tech support. <laughs> Noel's kindly let us all use his machine. <laughs> is that all good? It could be, yeah. Yeah, is that all good? Yeah. yeah, great. Yeah, and so the design of shower heads means that we can save 75% of water, which is fantastic. Okay? And then rainwater collection, which I'm sure a lot of you are doing as well, which is really important. From a personal point of view, with this, with this weather, and I've got an allotment, I've actually made the decision in the last week, I'm not planting anything else in my allotment. 
I've had been gathering loads and loads of old building materials to build a rain catcher for about five years. I've still not built the rain catcher. I now know I need to build a rain catcher because this will be probably the second year in a row where squashes and cucumbers are not going to grow. So I actually need to make a personal change and capture more water. Um, so, we all know about turning the tap off to when we're uh, brushing our teeth, we, we know all of that, but we need, it's not just us in this building, it is everybody needs to make a behavioural change to reduce that 81%. Um, so, it is possible for every new and old home to become more water efficient. And so in Norfolk Rivers Trust, we spend a lot of time looking at nature-based solutions. How, what can we do to uh, help our water, because it is so precious? So again, in a domestic context, you may well have come across these suburban urban drainage, drainage systems, okay, where they're trying to hold the water where it's falling, which is really important. We've had historically years and years and years of land managers and internal drainage board, et cetera, et cetera, straightening channels and getting the water straight out to sea as fast as possible. And we've now come to the realization that actually we need to hold the water. Okay? So I believe it's a ground up movement in a sense. As people living in houses, we need to really be aware of how we're using our water because it is precious. But also we do need people that are managing land to think about how can they hold the water in their catchment. Because yes, they might need it for irrigating potatoes, but at the same time, if they can hold water in their land holding, then that's going to recharge the aquifers, which is going to have a positive impact on um, how we abstract water for our own use. So rain gardens are a wonderful thing, okay? Really good. Uh, good for your well-being because they look wonderful and produce uh, food, but also, again, a way of stopping that water running off and down into our drainage systems. So something else we do is we work closely with uh, landowners and we create wetlands. So it might be low-grade agricultural land that wasn't producing much in terms of yield, but actually, historically, it may well have been marshland that had been drained so they could have cattle on for 12 months of the year. So this is a project over at the Wending Beck near Deerham, um, and you can see various ponds and scrapes. Some of them are in line, some of them are offline, so they're just scrapes on their own and they are holding water in catchment fairly close to a large population center um, and so it will help with our um, use of water and not only that it's not a side effect as such but it increases the biodiversity as well so we've seen it recently where um, we've dug new wetlands and two days later am i running out of time oh i knew that would happen um, we've got herons landing and another bird life we work closely with um, water companies as well to create these wetlands to reduce the phosphates and nitrates. And we've probably all heard about these lovely creatures. A lot of the work we do in the Norfolk Rivers Trust is the work that these chaps and chapesses would do. So these are the two beavers at the Glaven. And last year in the drought, that fairly dry woodland 18 months ago was wet. It stayed wet all throughout the drought and that's another way of holding the water. So basically we just need to work together. <laughs> um, all of us, homes, businesses, water companies, and it will get better. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Tim. That was fascinating. I had no idea how much water we use in our homes. That's terrifying. Right, I would like to hand over now to, um, to Noel Longhurst, um, who is an economic geographer and a lecturer in the School of Environmental Sciences at the University of East Anglia, and he's going to talk about healthy urban environments. Hello. Would you like a two-minute warning as well? Yeah, how long is the table? It's 15. Oh, that would be fine, but yeah. If I do something, I digress too much. Yeah, yeah, sure. Okay, hi, thanks everyone. Nice to see you all. Nice to see I'm not sure if it is a good thing to see familiar faces or not. Um, but thanks for coming along. Um, so my, I think my talk links in nicely with some of the themes that have already uh, been introduced. Uh, but I have, to, I have to start with two confessions. The first is that I came up with a title before I knew what I was going to talk about. So you'll have to judge where, how well I weave a talk around that. Um, and the second is that I don't know a huge amount uh, about health. I'm a kind of, like I say, an economic human geographer who's interested in sort of 
and does research around s system change for sustainability. But I have done, I do do some work on cities and how we change cities, so that's what we'll touch on. Um, or where's the clicker? Right, so for those of you, some of many, have people heard this saying before? Just quick show of hands. Have people heard this saying before? A few of you, not many. Okay, so this saying is a, it was a guy called uh, Thomas Fuller, 1662. Said he described Norwich as either a city in an orchard or an orchard in a city, so equal are the houses and trees blended in it. And I've always really, the reason I chose that as a title is I've always really loved that, that kind of phrase. It's kind of really evocative, it almost sounds utopian. Um, and I sometimes think, wouldn't it be wonderful if people said that about Norwich today, that you know, the trees and houses are so blended we didn't even know if the city was there. Uh, you couldn't see the houses from the trees. Um, and so that's one of the things that I want to talk about today is the, the importance of visions in stimulating positive environmental change and this is not a particularly uh, sort of original insight on my own but I think it is a really important one that we need visions if we're going to change things and um, this quote is kind of illustrated by this quote from the feminist author Bell Hooks who says we cannot imagine what we cannot imagine I always mess this up what we cannot imagine cannot come into being Okay, so the things we imagine, our imagination has effects, right? And visions are, we, we see from research that visions are really important in all sorts of processes of social and technological change. Okay, so even though they kind of come from, from our imagination, they, they have effects in the real world, you know? And these effects matter. So visions drive change in society and positive and radical visions are important. And we've kind of seen in the past how positive and radical envisions can about how we integrate nature into cities and many of these are actually into, relate to uh, issues concerning health. So this lady who you can't really see very clearly over here is Octavia Hill who was a really kind of inspirational visionary Victorian campaigner who did lots of good things. She set up the National Trust, she was one of the first kind of people to campaign around protecting the green belt around cities but one of the other things she did was to kind of buy up and protect areas of green space and open land in cities because she was concerned about she felt that these would be good for the well-being of uh, low-income impoverished people in London so this is an example of that is the Red Cross Garden in Southwark which has recently in recent years been restored and she described this as a kind of um, open air living room uh, in which you know the benefits of being nature could be shared amongst uh, low income people in London. So this at the time was a very radical vision, but many of the ideas of, the, of her and her other kind of contemporary Victorian campaigners are now much more mainstream, you know, and they get built into our cities. And also her her kind of intuition that obviously green space was good for the health of of kind of the of people in cities was also has also been proven by lots and lots of different science. I borrowed this graphic here from a, a, an EU report, but we know that, that nature, being close to nature, whether out in the countryside or in the city, has lots and lots of different health benefits for us, for our mental health, for our physical health, uh, you know, and, and these are kind of measured in lots of different ways, uh, just on the early, you know, cardiovascular, diabetes, all sorts of things, having nature in cities is good for us and can help with pollution and, and other things as well. So, a, a further thing then is that in terms of thinking about bringing nature back into cities, is, is the way in which it can potentially help us to adapt to climate change, which is obviously something that's already come up today. So reintegrating or bringing more nature into cities can help with, with the kind of effects that we are now seeing increasingly. So, you know, having trees in cities is really good for extreme health, uh, sorry, sorry, extreme heat, you know, providing shade and things like that. It can help with kind of the management of flooding by slowing down the movement of water. And then it also can help retain water uh, to help manage droughts uh, and water scarcity. So again, great benefits for us in terms of having more trees and other forms of nature in cities. But beyond the benefits to humans, there's also the need to address the biodiversity crisis and these are the these are the biodiversity stripes now you may not have seen these these were kind of launched last year many of you are probably familiar with the climate stripes which show the the warming of the planet in these kind of vertical panels 
going from kind of blue to red. Well, a, a professor at, at um, Derby University called Miles Richardson has, has kind of come up with these biodiversity stripes, which are a similar concept to visualise the loss of biodiversity. And you can then use data to kind of show this for a number of different species or sets of species and across different geographical scales. So this is UK priority species. And what unfortunately it's showing is a kind of 65% decline from 1970 to 2019 as it kind of goes from green and yellow to grey. So, you know, okay, cities are good for us, but bringing more nat you know, nature in cities is good for us, but it's also uh, something that we need to do for the benefit of nature itself as well. Okay, so, would anyone like to guess what this number is? Probably that's quite a hard question. Yeah. Whoa, yes, it is. <laughs> I think that deserves a round of applause. <laughs> Well done. That is the tree canopy cover in Norwich, 18.6%. Uh, it's from a report from a few years ago. The highest percentage in, in the UK was 45% in Farnham, which is in leafy Surrey, literally leafy Surrey, I think. Um, and so what I would say is that that gives us 18.6 is, you know, gives us basically quite a lot of scope for improvement. There's plenty of improvement to improve the, uh, the tree canopy in Norwich. So I think as, as we see... The, you know, the effects of biodiversity loss and, you know, there seems to be less insects around this year. I don't know if anyone else has noticed that in Norwich. Um, and climate change. I feel that we need positive and radical visions for bringing more nature into the city. So, if we were to try and fill Norwich with trees again, so we couldn't even tell if it was an orchard or a city, what might we need to do? I think that there is a role for kind of formal organisations like the council who have a new biodiversity strategy. And this goes back to the point of we all need to do things, so councils are really important. The, Nor the, the BID in Norwich as well, they're really interested in this. They produce quite a lot of reports around how we might bring more trees in and kind of integrate nature through, you know, the living walls and things like that. So both these organisations are doing good work in thinking about, OK, how do we uh, integrate nature into the kind of fabric, urban fabric more? Um, and also, if you want a really nice example of a city that's kind of taking this very seriously, then Melbourne in Australia kind of has, has basically has an, uh, what they describe as an urban forest. Um, their canopy is, they're trying to increase their canopy to 40% by 2040. It's just over, I think it's just over 20% at the moment. And they have loads of great resources and strategies and they try and encourage people to become like urban rangers and stuff like that. And they have also, as a geographer, some really cool maps uh, which show you literally all the trees in the city. Um, so if you're interested in the kind of a city that I think is really leading on this, this is, a, this is a good example. But I think it also goes beyond kind of formal organisations, um, and this is something that I'm kind of thinking about in my own work at the moment in, in terms of what does leadership look like in the context of the kind of current ecological crisis? Because, I mean, the traditional forms of leadership, of political leadership, are clearly insufficient, okay? So what other kinds of leadership do we need, and why are we leaving it, a lot of it to young people, I would say? Um, and I think I would like to argue that we can all potentially show leadership in our everyday lives and that has positive, tangible effects. And this is backed up by some of the, the research. So this is a really interesting recent paper which reviewed lots and lots, over 400 studies on behaviour change. So behaviour change is a really controversial topic, like how do we change people's behaviours and there's like lots of different theories and it comes from different disciplines about how we do this. What this was was like a meta-review of loads of different... Uh, studies and what basically came out at the top in terms of potentially having the most effects on changing other people's behavior was social comparison so highlighting our behavior to other people's so the idea that when we see like loads of our neighbors have solar panels we think ah oh, maybe we should get solar panels or maybe not driving and things like that so the most tangible thing we can do is do stuff and then hopefully that through this process of what's called social contagion um, influence other people. So when you're all doing little things, don't think those little things don't matter, because they do. And that's not, not to say we don't need bigger structural change, okay, okay. clearly we, we do, but marginal changes and small changes also matter, and we basically need kind of everything everywhere all at once. So if, if change starts at a very small scale, I would like to suggest that it can start with gardening, okay? However, my third confession is that I don't like gardening, okay? Well, what I don't like is just normal gardening of like mowing and cutting stuff. 
But what I do like is radical gardening, okay? So my co what I would like to say to you is we all need to be radical gardeners, right? And so I'm just going to explain what radical gardening looks like. So the first part of radical gardening... I send it to all three of us. The first part of a radical gardening is community gardening, which goes right back to Octavia Hill and creating uh, these kind of collective projects. And Norwich already has some kind of great examples of kind of community gardens where people come together to, to kind of create nature and grow food and things. And many of these have aspirations and goals and beyond just nature. They're about kind of improving well-being. They're about health. They're about skills. Um, the, the image I borrowed for the very beginning of this talk was actually from the Philadelphia Orchard Project because I was looking around for orchards and cities. Um, and they've created 66 community orchards in Philadelphia since 2007, which improve access to food and nature in low-income neighbourhoods. So these community gardens like Grapes Hill and Marpit, these are great things. These are a kind of form of radical gardening, I would argue, that are kind of really important collective endeavours. And are often trying to change the system to some extent. Then, the second type of radical gardening is... Gorilla gardening. So this is the illicit cultivation of someone else's land. So this is basically just going out, finding bits of dead space and using it and creating nature within it. And th this quote comes from, from this guy here, um, Richard Reynolds, who wrote this book about it and is a kind of well-known gorilla gardening activist. So this is about the reclamation of kind of abandoned or neglected spaces to improve their beauty and kind of biodiversity. But it's also, I think, a challenge to kind of the privatisation and commercialisation of urban space as well. And a way, again, of bringing people together. And apparently if you do this and you wear high vids, no one ever challenges you because they think you're from the council. Just, just a tip. Uh, okay, and then finally, I think we can be radical gardeners at home. And, and gardens are actually a huge source of biodiversity in cities. And studies have shown that they have the same number of species as semi-wild rural habitats, okay? And the, the author, Ben Wilson, describes this as the suburban jungle, which is a great, again, another really nice kind of concept, I think. So, but like I said, we need to be radical gardeners at home. And I think that what that means is to be, to reject the norms of gardening and embrace practices which are more biodiverse and climate resilient, like in the way you were talking about with your allotment. So stop mowing, stop using chemicals, let, let weeds prosper. I would, and I was, as I was writing this, I was very pleased to see Alice Fowler, who is a proper gardener, in The Guardian, basically endorsing this approach to kind of what she describes as laid-back gardening. And if you actually saw my garden, it completely is a laid-back garden. But that is my kind of garden, okay? So I would like to encourage you all to become radical gardeners in one way or another, and join me in turning orchard, Norwich back into an orchard, which I think would be great for, for all of our health and good for the planet as well. And um, just before I do finish, being a lecturer, I have to give you some further reading to do. Uh, if you're interested in radical gardening, this is a great book by George Mackay, who's a professor in cultural studies at the UEA, uh, which is all about the relationship between radical politics and gardening. This is a book that the RHS have just put out about resilient gardening. So if you need, if like in you are trying to adapt your garden for climate change, this is literally out. This is also out and is about the relationship between nature and cities. Um, although I have the copy out of the library at the moment, so just let me finish it and then I'll uh, take it back. Okay. Okay, and so that, yeah, thank you very much, that's me. Thank you so much. Um, a real call to arms. We should all get out. Um, unfortunately, um, our fourth speaker hasn't been able to join us, so um, we're going to move now into questions. So what I'm going to do is we'll, we'll give you just a moment to pause while we bring our speakers up onto the stage, and then they'll, if you guys want to grab those chairs, um, and then there'll be a roving mic, and if you have any burning questions that you've been sat with, then you'll be you'll be able to ask them. You're gonna you're gonna have to be 
running running to and fro. Oh, I'll just I'll just get the speakers to come up to here to answer. Yeah. 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 Okay. Okay. So if you have a question, um, please could you raise your hand? There we go. If you could say um, which speaker you want to direct the question at as well, that'd be helpful. I noticed with the particulates you focused your statistics on PM 2.5. Is that because they're the most threatening to human health, or why choose that one? Yes, you come up here. Yes, I mean the smaller sized particles are ones that get right into your lungs and down into your bloodstream and ultimately can get you know, up into your brain. So that's why, from a health point of view, we look at these smaller sized particles. And there is also concern about the ultra-fine particles, which are even smaller than that, but they PM 2.5 is any particle below 2.5 micrometers in diameter, so it does include the, the ultra-fine ones, but they make up a very small part of the mass, which is essentially what this unit is, is micrograms per meter cubed. So, um, yeah, it's because it gets into our health system. Okay. Yeah. We've got someone at the back. Um, sorry, yes. Um, it's all very well, the science has been, that you presented together, if you like, has been around a very long time. But is there any evidence that central government is doing anything to act on it in a consistent manner? And will there be such evidence in future? I mean, they're, they're doing nothing. I mean, the present government does absolutely nothing. It's not interested in anything of this along these lines, I assume. I haven't seen much myself, but... I find it very depressing. Um, I, I mean, even banning banning certain products. Um, shall, shall, I, shall I ask all of the speakers to respond mm, to that please, in turn? Yes, thanks, I'm sure thanks. they've all got something to say. Thank you. Um, well, there's there's a lot of legislation to try and limit. Um, air pollution and the government is taking a number of steps so when I was talking about Norwich air pollution NO2 concentrations decreasing over time it's because they've put a, a sort of re re requirement on local authorities to reduce air pollution so Norwich City Council has brought in various measures and there have been grants available to do that to try and for example um, upgrade bus systems so that you, you know the buses become the, the, the higher euro standards uh, there's the you'll find on castle meadow for example there's limits for vehicles what vehicles can go there so there's lots of sort of clean air plans that local authorities have had to put in place um, because of government legislation so in norwich they're relatively small but all these clean air zones that you hear about in Birmingham, trying to put one into Manchester, there's one that's just started in Bath and so on, these are all come from government legislation and requiring local authorities to put forward plans to reduce emissions and subsequent concentrations of, in, in that case, NO2. Um, they can do more, I'm, I'm not completely defending the government here, but there's a lot of work that is going on and the PM targets, again, Although they haven't got a limit that's as low as the WHO, a lot of work has already gone into trying to understand how low we can actually bring PM concentrations down. Because as I said, a lot of it is imported. You've got all these secondary sources. So there was caution about setting a limit that, that would be achievable. Um, but there certainly is there's a, a when I, I'm trying to think, I mean, I've had a long career in air quality. If I go back about sort of um, 20 or 30 years ago, air pollution was a lot worse than it is now. It's, it's improved immensely because of, of work that government has done, um, but our awareness of the impact of air pollution has increased, and so we're more concerned. So although concentrations have come down, we now understand its impact on health, and so we want to drive it down even further. Um, so, I mean, I'll stop there and let the others say something. But there is a lot that's going on, but and we have our own collective responsibilities as well to do our part. I think. Um, so, yes and no would be the simple answer. But in, in terms of the sphere with the rivers and working closely with farmers, there's been frustration because of the new schemes that are supposed to be coming into place and farmers not wanting to sign up because they're unsure because of our political system having this short rotation between 
uh, prime ministers and government and elections. But there is hope in the sense that corporates and other uh, organisations that have an interest, so if you think about corporations, they are worrying about their supply chain. So I talked about the fact that you know nine cans of water to produce one can of soft drink. They're realising if they don't invest in the basics of supply chain, they're going to run out of something to sell. So I think it is, what we're seeing is government legislation is good, but targets are being shifted or lowered because they're worrying about elections and voting. But at the same time, there's this ground shift where landowners, land managers, corporates, um, non-government governmental organisations are now moving all in the same direction. And so it's almost, it's a movement, I would call it. So I, I try and ignore the government at the moment or generally, uh, and just think what's actually happening on the ground. And as someone that travels across the county a lot, it's, it, it's a story of hope. Seeing wetlands being restored, seeing corporates putting in millions of pounds to pay for those wetlands, that's great. And actually what government will do, because they'll be worrying about their elections, is they'll see that ground, groundswell and they will start to change policy or adapt policy. So in a sense, it goes back to my original answer, yes and no. <laughs> Okay, I think I'll, that's off. I mean, yeah, um, yeah, I mean, my talk was a bit different, so because I didn't have a particular domain. I guess the question of like why doesn't stuff happen as much as it should or it seems to have. Sh I mean, from, from a kind of point of view of cities, one of the problems in the UK is we have a very centralised political system, right? So not much power is properly devolved down. So the reason they say, for example, Norwich couldn't do as much as Melbourne, I imagine it's very much to do with the political structure, right? So ever, you know, since Margaret Thatcher and this really get, and maybe even before then, but basically when political power was very much centralised, it stopped stuff happening more at like local levels. So in terms of kind of ability to raise money, ability to do things without being directed by central government to do stuff, right? So. If we, were to, if we wanted like, local areas to be more ambitious and transformative, we basically need to look at the broader political structures of how we do things as, as much as anything. You know, it's the way in which decisions get made that's really important. I'll stop there. Do we have another question? Brilliant. Unless I missed something, there was no reference to plastic pollution. Uh, I gather it... Um, Evidence is emerging that fetuses are, are being born with microplastics in their system. I wonder if there is uh, any take on this. Thank you. Tim, do you want to? It's not really my realm of uh, expertise. What I can say is that when we are working creating wetlands, particularly with water companies, is that we have strong links with universities across the country and we do have. Uh, you know, PhD students looking at pollution transport, looking at microplastics and how, you know, for example, when Anglian Water treat the water, they haven't been filtering for microplastics in the past, but with, you know, with research, they're now working out how do we uh, reduce that pollution transport in terms of microplastics. And I know I've heard uh, or read that actually it's quite scary, but, you know, in terms of the industry along Riverside, um, margins where they're angle grinding fiberglass or whatever and actually there's evidence now that in freshwater mollusks there are tiny shards of glass fiber strands so i think there is an impact but i'm not the person to ask in terms of whether it's you know it's actually affecting uh, the growth of humans before they're born um, but i know that people are moving towards well what do we do because they're realizing this is going to be a, a major issue I could just say um, I'm aware of a little bit of the research around this, um, not in great detail, but I know that there's been evidence of, of microplastics in placentas um, and, and in fetuses. So it is, it is, it, it's a real issue. We don't know entirely what the impact is yet, but we do know that microplastics tend to adsorb other chemicals onto them. Um, and one of the other big problems is pharmaceutical pollution. Um, so people disposing of medications poorly but also where we excrete it we, we pee it out we poo it out um, so really really important um, from a, a health perspective um, and, and, and it's interesting because I think this is not necessarily a message that people have got but one of the most sustainable things you can do is look after your health and stay well 
and, and not require a load of healthcare activity. Obviously, sometimes you can't avoid it, but doing things like eating well, active transport, um, spending time in green spaces, um, those things help us to stay well. Um, but if you are on medication, please don't flush it down the toilet, please don't put it into landfill, take it back to the pharmacy. Any other questions? We have one at the front. Thank you. I've got two questions really, but one's about idling. Um, engine idling. I've heard it's illegal, but is it ever, does anyone ever pay a fine for it? Because that to me seems an awful waste of, well, adding to pollution with that. Sorry, can you not understand me? Idling, yes. Mm -hmm. Because if it is illegal, or we do want to stop it, why on earth aren't we having some public campaign over it? So that's my first question, and the other is more of a confession, because I know I waste a lot of water in the home trying to get hot water. I have to go through all this cold water before I get the hot. So what's a solution like that? Could it be better planned housing, piping, whatever? I have no idea, but I know it's an awful waste. That's a very good question. So we'll go to Claire first. That's a very good question about idling, and there's some conflicting evidence about this, as there always is. Um, so, if you're going to sort of be sat, sat, sat somewhere in your car for a, a decent amount of time, and this is the question, how long, it's definitely worth t turning your engine off. But catalytic converters, for example, they work when they've got a high temperature, and when you switch off the engine it cools and so starting up again can lead to greater emissions. So there's this balance between whether you should turn your engine off or not and this you know and a lot of it in modern cars now have this start stop technology where the engines actually switch off automatically when they stop and restart again. But yeah you know if you stop for a minute or so definitely switch off your engine but it's a bit of a debate about, other, you know, shorter time periods. I didn't think I was going to be asked the plumbing question. <laughs> <laughs> um, but so I've been thinking about it whilst Claire's been answering. So it is, a, it is a problem and it's to do with the distance from the hot water tank to where you're wanting that hot water. As I said earlier, it's a behavioural change. So it's that idea that actually and it might not work for everyone, but understanding that actually you can start washing up your dishes in cold water whilst you're waiting for the hot water to come through, that's quite effective. Um, we often at work are talking about how we conserve, work, conserve water, so quite often some of us are gathering that cold water in bottles, putting it aside to water the garden or use when, you know, when cold water is appropriate and then using the hot water so it's not being wasted. So there's little changes like that. And then I guess the other thing is to talk to your plumber. <laughs> <laughs> and to say what can I do but it is to do with the infrastructure in your houses and actually I'm, I don't know of anything I've not read anything about how that can be changed obviously you've got on demand systems where you you know it just heats the water that comes through but you'd have to have that at every hot water tap you wanted so yeah that's yeah <laughs> okay we've got a oh we've got one down there Sorry, I already had the microphone. <laughs> and I have two two questions. Uh, one is um, on behalf of uh, as a wearing as a member of the clergy here. And um, one of my questions would be, what do you think the links between religion and spirituality and um, eco friendliness might be? Um, can you can you talk a little bit about your views on that? And then the second is much more personal, which is um, for the rivers guy. How, uh, what are Anglo Water doing about sewage into our rivers? That was going to come up if I didn't ask it, so thank you. I'm trying to think of the uh, biblical quote. Is it giving from Peter to take from Paul? I can't remember what it is, but that's Anglo Water. So they've been fined millions for putting sewage into our waterways very recently, I think beginning of May. At the same time, we're working really closely with them to develop integrated constructed wetlands that reduce uh, the, uh, or increase the quality, if you like, of the water going back into our rivers. So, for example, uh, water treatment works will reduce the amount of ammonia and nitrates uh, and sediment uh, pollution, but it's still legally, with the Water Framework Directive, allowed to go into our rivers. 
but Anglian Water are supporting us and we're now building our fourth one in county to build these wetlands that actually will reduce by another 80% the amount of ammonia and nitrates going into our rivers. So in a sense they are, yeah, it's, they've got poor infrastructure, they've had poor, uh, you know, in terms of investment into their systems, but they are also thinking about the future um, and realising that they've got to make some changes as well. Um, it's a difficult, for me, it's a difficult answer to, uh, to the question to answer in a sense because we work so closely with them and actually I think we have to think about that is that actually we cannot do a whole global system change we have got a capitalist society globally now and actually we need to think about well what can each of us offer whether it's a corporate whether it's a person down the street um, and and then just work together as a movement really slowly slowly and it's long term I mean we're talking decades and hundreds of years I think and we'll keep moving, hopefully, in the right direction. Oh, what was the other question? Spirituality. Yes. I can actually do that. You can do that one. And water's great for spirituality. We've got lots of evidence of water being very special. Walsingham, Bronze Age deposits, ritual deposits, and, and whatever. So it is, water is life, and it's, yeah, I believe strongly that there's a spirit there, definitely. <laughs> so, yeah, actually, I could say a little bit about this, um, which, is, which is nice. Uh, so when I, I did my PhD on um, the town of Totnes in Devon, which some of you will have heard of, and, and it's, a very, it's well known as a very green alternative place. And my PhD was really, why is Totnes this green alternative place? And does that mean you can do more interesting stuff there? And uh, one of the interesting things about it was the number of different spiritual practices and different kinds of religion and, and kind of all sorts of different things, new age type stuff as well that were going on as well, and how connected they were to a lot of the green environmental activity. So I think there is, a lot of the time, there is a really fundamental link between different ways of knowing the world, different forms of kind of spiritual connection, which are really important and which kind of underpin uh, other ways of knowing nature outside of the dominant kind of extractivist approach. So we can even think of like indigenous forms of knowledge as well. So I'm always really heartened when I see kind of any form of religion kind of engaging with kind of the environment and kind of promoting environmental practice because it's fundamental I mean you know in all of, the lo mo all of the main ones is like looking after the planet is a kind of core you know tenant right so yeah I think there's lots of interesting connections people can find their own path but uh, the, yeah knowing nature in different ways through different forms of practice and things like that is really important and very important to lots of people I'll stop rambling Actually, my, fir my first, I was going to, got a question to, uh, to put to the panel, but uh, first in response to that, uh, the, there is uh, an interfaith environment forum uh, for Norfolk and Waveney, which has been set up recently by, well, the impetus it, to actually set it up came from the Anglican Bishop of Norwich, uh, but with Muslim inspiration and it, it has people from pretty much all the faiths that are represented in Norfolk and Waveney. Um, I sit on that, uh, uh, that forum and uh, whilst we are I think, you know, finding, finding out where, we, where we're going, um, absolutely there's a strong role for faith, religion, spirituality, whatever you want to call it. Um, and I think that brings me to my question because that tends to look beyond the silos. And I do worry with a lot of the campaigns and the way that policies are implemented that we put things into silos too much. You know, air quality, for instance, wood burners. Well, okay, but surely wood burners, as long as it's not kiln dried and as long as it's properly seasoned, that's actually relatively carbon neutral compared with burning gas, say. Um, trees, you know, we have a lot of trees in Norwich, but uh, the city council is not very keen on planting them, and will cut them down if they think they're going to be dangerous in 20 years' time. You know, that doesn't, that's not sustainable. Um, you know, I could go on taking examples, but I've got, perhaps the biggest silo is that things get put into uh, the capitalist boxes. And we, you said that, well, we've got capitalism worldwide. Yeah, that's the problem, actually. And... Uh, we need to think beyond the lowest common denominator. We need to think beyond the bottom line, um, beyond the completely uh, anonymous 
emails and bills that come through from utility companies. I, for instance, last August had a letter from Anglian Water saying well, our house had used more a lot more water than comparable houses. In other words, other ones down the street. Well, of course we had. That was August. It was really dry. The water butts were empty. We have, we've got a bigger garden than anyone else near us. We were watering. Yes. So, inevitably. But things get put into silos. And that really doesn't help when, uh, at the end of the day, we're trying to p change people's minds, change people's behaviour. And... You, the idea of yeah, seeing what other people are doing is really important. But if what other people are doing is finding that they do not understand what's supposed to be happening or find it difficult because you have to go online to get a permit for a low emission zone or whatever. You know, it's all these silos that actually prevent people from doing the right thing. Was there a question in there? <laughs> <laughs> Does anybody want to respond to that? I mean, I feel like... I, I can yeah. So, um, rivers, we, you know, we started by thinking about streams and rivers and tributaries. Um, and I'm talking about we as in people that were starting to think about river health, but actually then it became a more catchment-based approach. So actually, where's that rainfall landing? Where's it ending up? And actually increasingly in the last two, three, four, five, six years, we're now looking at whole landscape approaches. So actually we're joining up the air the biodiversity and the water health. Now some of that, and I am worried, some of it is driven because there's going to be a financial gain. So, you know, land managers will be able to gain. Basic farm payment is 200 pounds an acre if, if they don't do anything, a hectare, sorry. Okay, but then they're being, going to be rewarded for increasing nature capital. And I, I shake and quiver at the thought of nature being capitalized. But when we actually see on the ground changes, because we're now taking this whole landscape approach, it's wonderful. And actually part of that is it's not just about the birds, the trees and the water, it's actually about the people. And you're talking about how do we encourage behavioural change. Well, a lot of these whole landscape recovery projects have a strong pillar of uh, public engagement. So it goes back to human health. So actually, it's, it's great. I see, I see it again, going back to this word movement. It is a whole movement. If people are able to access the countryside rather than, you know, our lovely hotspots of the Titchwell uh, Nature Reserve and Cly and all of those wonderful places, but actually can access, they can walk to their next village where their uncle lives along a field margin that normally would not be allowed to walk along. And they see the ground nesting birds and they hear the skylarks and they see the lovely water and they feel great. That's amazing. And if that becomes ingrained in our, uh, you know, our behaviours and our culture, then actually the capitalist aspect will I'm not sure whether we're going to get rid of capitalism, but I know that it's, it's going to move in the right direction. I've used that phrase again, but I feel, you know, you know that's, it's better than nothing. <laughs> Absolutely. And, I, I, you know, growing up in Norfolk as a kid and seeing the stubble burning and kite flying on a stubble field after harvest and being in a silo, being in West Norfolk and just seeing my little bit. And now in my role, I get to go to Strumpshaw, I get to go to near Yarmouth and I get to go near the River Mun. And I'm seeing lots of land managers making significant changes that are increasing biodiversity, that there's more access for public uh, and the water quality is increasing, improving. I think that's great. And in a sense, I don't care who pays for it, <laughs> as long as it happens. <laughs> So, um, I know Chris, we, we, we met a long, long time ago when we both started as undergraduates at the School of Environmental Sciences at, at UEA, and Noel's also at, at, at that school. Now, the school was set up in 1967, and its ethos was interdisciplinary science, and it was absolutely unique about environmental sciences. Now, this has become a much more widespread concept. And as I've gone through my career, I've gone from, you know, research grants where we just are in our, very much in our little silos to, to projects now where it's very interdisciplinary. And a lot of the funding is actually requires you to be interdisciplinary now. So things have improved immensely. Um, your point about the um, wood burners, it's true. It's, it's relatively carbon neutral. Um, now, Obviously, the government is trying to look at ways to, to get to the road to net zero. And so the air quality expert group that I sat on, which was 
um, DEFRA's committee had a joint work with the Climate Change Committee where we were looking at the impacts of climate change or let's say the road to net zero, the, the, the pathways that we were going to go and what would be the impact on air quality. So government is understanding that there are these sort of interlinking and that and we need to look at this interdisciplinary and get groups together. It's complex, it is complex. And when I spoke to the chair of the committee specifically about this wood burning, because one of the approaches that the government's going to do is is to put in huge amounts of forest. I mean, it's, I don't know how they're going to do it, to be honest, but that's one of the aims, is to put in lots of trees to try and bring down the carbon out of the atmosphere. Now, um, I sort of, you know, had a chat with this guy, who was the chair of the committee, about wood burns, and he said, well, it's better if when we cut down these trees, rather than burning, putting the carbon back in, we actually sort of retain the carbon in that wood for example, through building materials. So yes, we need to grow these trees, but rather than burn them, let's use the wood for other things. So it's there's a lot of thinking behind this. It is complex, and I would say that we are moving in the right direction, but there's still, um, you know, so much is interconnected that, and it's very hard for experts to become experts in a field and know everything else. So it's really important to get together and try and understand and communicate with each other and learn each other's languages. And it is improving, but it can always be better. I think we've got the hall till um, four o'clock, so we've got about another 10 minutes. If there are any other questions, we've got one here. If you could try and keep your questions fairly brief, that would be great. Could we someone tell me why the airlines don't pay tax on their fuel? Think you have a jumbo jet? And what makes four litres of fuel? Sorry, I didn't... I didn't could you why don't airlines get ta pay tax on their fuel? And what makes four litres of fuel? Claire, are you able to... I mean, I've, I'm not sure that we've got any experts on the taxation. System. 100 tons of wood, thousands of years. Leave it where it is. Thank you. Um, yes, I've got a question for Noel, please. And that is, um, how can the loss of private gardens be reversed? And I'm thinking here of people uh, paving over their gardens, uh, removing hedges, putting down plastic lawns, etc., mm. etc. And then, secondly, we're also seeing um, conversion of public green space to um, all-weather sports pitches, which again involves fossil fuels, microplastics, heats up the urban air, loss of biodiversity, and so on. But it's becoming a, a galloping problem. Mm -hmm. Okay. I was trying to do a positive talk, and uh, <laughs> so no, I mean I think you're right. I think that the, the, uh, it is a challenge, like even just getting people not to destroy kind of biodiversity that already exists, let alone enhance it further. Uh, the plastic lawn thing is a really interesting uh, thing. I saw a tweet today to say that is it? It's either Wales or Ireland that are thinking of banning plastic lawns, and that's probably what the kind of thing you're going to uh, you're going to need to do. Uh, to stop it and then I guess oh, it's a cultural thing isn't it it's like this is kind of what the point I was trying to make a little bit about we have a dominant kind of culture where most people do what we might see as the normal thing and it's kind of people trying to create a different kind of culture through everyone seeing other people that's the kind of thing about the social contagion to some extent so if and it's only I guess the only way we do that is by more people doing it and by, by the media kind of picking up on that and reinforcing that and things like that. I mean, it isn't an easy thing. I mean, what, I think one of the fundamental problems at the moment in society is, uh, is the idea of personal freedom and how we might have to uh, curtail that to deal with the kind of ecological crisis. And that would involve things like, you can imagine if we tried to ban plastic lawns, it'd be the plastic lawn, lawn you know, we love plastic lawn. Just like, you know, look at all the politics around the low traffic neighbourhood stuff that goes on, which ties into air pollution, right? So we had low traffic neighbourhoods, they seem to have a really good effect. You know, okay, there, there might be some issues around them sometimes, but a, a huge reaction to, I want to drive just down the street to get them a burger. Or, so these things are always contentious. And I think freedom is, the, the idea that we should have 
absolute freedom to do what we want is a really challenging problem for environmentalism, I think. It ties in with flying as well, you know, you should be able to fly on hold every year, it's fine. Yeah. So once we start saying, well, maybe our free, frequent fly attacks or things like that. So, yeah, just by all of this trying to do things, I mean, it's a very, it's a bit of a weak answer, but, you know, there are no easy answers. These things are very political and we just have to all try and do the bits we can do and hope that somehow we gain some momentum in those areas, I think. Having more green councils would probably help, but that's not a party political broadcast, but, but you know. Planting of trees in urban environments. Um, Hayhill's a private example. Why on earth do we plant uh, forest sorry, trees in urban environments? Put the microphone when... closer to your sorry. mouth. We can't hear you. Try and speak a little bit more slowly. Yes, sir. Um, planting trees in urban environments. Why on earth do we plant forest trees in urban environments? Um, Hay Hill is a prime example. They're spending millions on improving Hay Hill. You've got trees there which are far too big. They need pollinating. But as soon as you cut, a, you're not allowed to cut a branch off a tree because there's an uproar. I mean, it's going to improve the trees by pollinating them. And also, when you plant trees in urban environments, it's better to plant a species of tree. <coughs> it's not going to grow 100 foot tall, but a shorter version. I, I should probably answer that. Even though I'm not, I'm not an arboriculturalist, and I don't. I mean, you know, my talk was like, yeah, let's just put more trees in cities. Um, but I agree, there's probably the right kind of trees in the right kind of places uh, that, that needs to be considered in terms of the kind of things you're trying to, to kind of uh, service with them. I mean, one point I would make is that there's in, it's interesting when we think about what is natural or what is native in, in, in kind of, you know, particularly in cities, and that's what this kind of urban jungle book talks about a little bit, you know. Most, I mean, you know, most things that we might even think of indigenous to the UK didn't mostly start in the UK or whatever. So there's something about the way in which kind of ecosystems are always evolving and kind of uh, changing and, you know, species intermingling. But yeah, I mean, I, I get your point that if we're putting trees into cities, we should probably think about the types of trees. And I mean, and this goes into the kind of resilient gardening stuff as well. You know, the, the things we're planting now, we need to be thinking about the effects of climate change and what's going to be able to survive in the next 10, 20 years as, as kind of Norwich gets on average warmer, you know? So maybe it'll be orchards of oranges and lemons or something like that, I don't know. <laughs> Your question um, highlights also this interdisciplinarity that we've been talking about because trees are one of the a significant source of the volatile organic compounds that I spoke about. So when I said about the, the pine fresh smells that you get, that's because trees give off, um, basically they give off monoterpenes, so pinenes and limonenes and so on. So we have to be careful about what trees we plant in an urban environment because they can actually lead to increased particulate matter through these reactions that I was talking about in the atmosphere. So everything needs to be joined up, otherwise we can have negative impacts as well. Sorry, sorry, I've got the microphone. I've, I've, nabbed the, I've nabbed the microphone. Sorry. Can I ask a question? Um, I think it's clear I'd like to ask. Um, in Norfolk, there are quite a lot of people who haven't, haven't got a gas supply for central heating or anything else. They're relying probably on oil at the moment. And is there a biofuel which is better than the present supply of oil? Is there a biofuel? Would, would biofuel be a better option than the general oil which is supplied? In, in rural settings? I'm one of those people actually, I live in rural Norfolk. Um, I'm going to struggle to answer your question um, because it, it's partly because it depends what we're talking about here because obviously this burning oil is burning carbon and releasing carbon to the atmosphere. Um, I'm not sure that a biofuel would be any better in, well obviously if we can you have to be careful about where you're producing it. You, you know, you've got to grow, and we need a lot of land to grow all these trees we need to try and offset our carbon. So to have lots of biofuels is actually probably going to use up land we'd rather use for other resources, to be honest. Um, from an air quality point of view, then we don't really get that many emissions too much from these things, if, you know, in the systems that we have, but we do have to be careful of that as well. Less damaging than standard oil emissions, or I mean, the, the suppliers, the um, sort of the sellers of biofuel, make this claim. I think sometimes that it's actually better in terms of emissions than. than yeah, I, I'm I'm not entirely sure. I'm, I'm not sure about that. I mean, I think the the main thing about the biofuels is that you're actually growing 
the fuel taking carbon up from the atmosphere, you know, so that you're, it's, it's supposed to be sort of a neutral, carbon neutral. But from an air quality point of view, it, the biggest thing you're getting is that whenever you combust something, you're turning the nitrogen oxygen in the atmosphere to nitrogen dioxide. So any combustion really is, is bad, yeah. So I, I can't say, it's, to be honest, it's better either way. I think we've only got time for one more short question because we're approaching four o'clock. Okay, I'll keep it short. Would the panel agree with the proposition that largely our problem stems from the fact that we want more and more from a finite planet? We cannot have infinite growth from a finite planet. So I'm asking the question, what are the solutions the, 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 the panel proposes to suggest uh, an, an agenda of negative growth where we can have less consumerism and more uh, concentrate on what we need to do to re revive the planet. That's a really big question for uh, <laughs> how do we move to a, to a, a no, no growth or away from gro growth economies um, in, in five words each maybe, yeah? <laughs> we could debate that for weeks. Yeah. I mean, it's, it is, it's a really great question, yeah, and I think we are, I mean, it's, it's proven again in the science, we're living beyond kind of planetary boundaries uh, in, a, in a capitalist system that is, that is fundamentally unsustainable, right? But, and I would say that the, the movement around degrowth or post-growth is getting bigger and bigger. There was a kind of big conference hosted by the EU, the second one they've held this year, so they've had, they had one in about 2018 and then a much bigger one this year. So the idea that we... Yeah, well, I mean, the idea goes back to the least the seventies that we, we're kind of exceeding the kind of, you know limit, the original limits to growth. So, the idea is kind of becoming more prevalent, but the system, the dynamics of the capitalist system, are, you know, are very hard to reverse. You know, and I think so. And again, it goes back to my point earlier. How do you, you know politically? How do we persuade people to live differently? There are some bits that might be appealing, like universal basic income, or maybe working less. Those things might appeal, but we have quite a dominant capitalist consumer culture that is hard to displace. I mean, if you, my personal view is, and this is based on some of the kind of, you know, theories around how systems change, is the system probably needs to fall apart more before new alternative systems can emerge, basically. So, the capitalist, uh, basically capitalism is also, anyway, how long have I got to tell you a lecture on this? But basically, <laughs> capitalism is like been fueled by fossil fuels, right, for 200 years. It's, cap it's fossil fuels that have really led to this, the levels of abundance we've got. That's going to end one way or another, right? That's either going to end because we're going to burn up the planet or we find a different way of having a complex civilization. So that's coming to an end, but what emerges after it is, is very up to the debate, I think. Maybe green consumerism, yeah, but I think basically capitalism has to kind of fall apart, really. Did you want to add anything to that, Tim? Um, Innovation, problem solving, spiritual, wonderful, yeah. Like, it's it's uh, holistic, isn't it, I suppose? It's, it's, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and I think, I mean, for me, I th you know, I, I think it comes back to that kind of what we were talking about, get, about getting out of our silos. Um, if we're going to combat a system which is so well funded and, and very smart, and when we talk about you know, people kind of rising up against, you know, low traffic neighbourhoods and stuff. Corporations are brilliantly good at making that kind of thing appear grassroots, making it happen. Um, so it's people like us coming together and doing what we can um, that, that is, is what's needed. And I think coming back to that spirit, spiritual question, the, the question I constantly ask myself, and I think it crosses into all sorts of different faiths and belief systems, is what does it mean to be a good person at this point in history? And how can I bring that into being? Um, so thank you so much, all of you, for your interest today. And, and, and I'd like to ask you to thank again our speakers who were not, didn't just give fantastic talks, but have fielded your questions absolutely brilliantly. So thank you very much. I'd like to put your hands together. <laughs>
Um, before everyone goes, just a quick word from Norwich Friends of the Earth. On behalf of Great Big Green Week, we have a participant survey on the way out. If you're able to scan the QR code on your phone and complete it online about the whole event overall, that would be really helpful for them and for us. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Oh, is it? Yeah. On that? Oh, oh, okay. Oh, really? Okay. Do you want to? I mean, you can borrow mine if you want. I got to, seriously, borrow my copy, seriously. Okay. No, 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 honestly, yeah, because I've just sent it to myself. If you want to read it, then seriously.